Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Sotirios. Actually, I'm working at uh, UCL in uh, London in the Department of Neuroradiology. Um, it's the biggest neuro-oncology center in the uh, United Kingdom. We have thousands of referrals every year for brain tumor surgery, brain tumor biopsies, or uh, of course the treatment follow-up. So today it's about the treatment follow-up and all the problems that treatment follow-up may uh, have or may show to you as diagnostic neuroradiologist uh, when you want to assess the treatment response and to differentiate between treatment-related changes from true recurrence. Uh, diagnosis that has major implications for um, the further treatment. So it is an old problem and uh, today I would like to show you how we approach it in a novel way in order to increase our diagnostic confidence. So the key term here is of course the perfusion MRI but first of all let me give you a short overview as about the high-grade gliomas, the, the type of tumor that we will focus on today. So it is 80% of the newly diagnostic cases. Unfortunately, the, ma the majority of them are GBMs. So when uh, we have a patient with GBM, the first thing is to achieve, or the neurosurgeon is to have a maximum safe resection. However, it is not always possible. Uh, then it comes to external beam radiation and administration of concomitant temozolomide. Now, when we are in the point to assess the treatment response to this adjuvant temozolomide plus radiation. So the very classical and very conventional way is to measure the enhancing tumor volume. This has been something which is established through the, out the last decades. Actually, when I recently reviewed the literature, there were reports telling us that this is more than 60 years. Of course, 60 years before we didn't have MRI but it is actually the way to assess even post-mortem uh, the tumor burden. So the gadolinium enhancement is pretty sensitive, it's coupled linked to the neuro, neuro, neovascularity, but of course it's at the same time very unspecific and contrast enhancement may be seen in true progression as well as in pseudo progression or otherwise treatment related changes. Now Using advanced MRI, we have an array of tools to differentiate or to attempt to differentiate between these two phenomena. The most widely used uh, advanced MRI technique is the perfusion MRI and among the different perfusion MRIs, the one which is the dynamic susceptibility contrast enhanced. So the technique has been probed the last years in many institutions around the world. Now, um, there is a, actually a very nice meta-analysis done in 2016 where the results were a little bit conflicting. There were institutions reporting very nice and very highly specific results about the diagnostic value of DSC and other institutions that they said that it was a moderate diagnostic value. So. Um, it seems that the methodology plays a very major role when we have to assess the diagnostic value. And of course, the pool sensitivity and specificity is fairly high, is uh, in the magnitude of 90%. But uh, let me go through some shortcomings and pitfalls um, when we talk about the DSC MRI studies and how DSC is utilized, is post processed, is evaluated in order to establish a diagnosis. So when we talk about, or all the institutions, they talk about DSC MRI experience, they have done a single time point. So throughout the treatment, there was a suspicion of pseudo progression or true recurrence. They examined the patient on once and they tried to establish a diagnosis. Then in these studies, there are not clearly defined inclusion or exclusion criteria, or are we talking about gliomas, are we talking about oligodendrogliomas, are we talking about metastasis? That's all these things play a major role. The leakage correction is a very uh, well-known problem and there have been various attempts to correct for leakage correction, uh, to address for leakage uh, in the um, previous years and the algorithms get better and better in doing that. 
and the last thing is about the region of interest analysis and of course about normalizing the CBV values because everybody knows that the DSC is not a 100% quantitative method. So we tried to address most of these previous shortcomings and pitfalls in our study design. Um, I will present you our experience from a single center retrospective clinical study. All the patients were referred to us with very strict inclusion criteria from the neuro-oncology MDT and we had the opportunity not only to perform single time point analysis but also multiple time points. The referrers were happy to have uh, repetitive exams uh, in the follow-up interval, in the regular follow-up interval, which is three to four months in order to help with establishing the diagnosis. All patients had the same treatment, which was combined, standard combined chemo radiation. Um, about now the perfusion sequence itself, it was a gradient echo EPI done on three Tesla and uh, in order to minimize uh, the effect of uh, leakage and on the images we went for a, a reduced bar, uh, flip angle which was about 60 degrees so everything was uh, the patients were also preloaded with gadolinium prior to the dsc mri so for the post-processing in order to present you now the cumulative results we uh, took a novel approach so we co-registered all exams in a common 3d space so and this was not only for the structural, not only for the perfusion, but for the structural as well, T1, T2, flare. And then we manually segmented the enhancing tumor portions and applied the masks on the perfusion maps. So now I will show you the results on, uh, after applying the mask of the tumor on the RCBV. So we used for the leakage correction and for the uh, CBV normalization the uh, features of an NNL software. So these are some screenshots. We, in order uh, to save some time, we did all the exams uh, using the batch function in NNL. Uh, saved us a lot of time. Then we did the co-registration um, with the um, anatomy. Here are some representative AIF curves and uh, here you see the T2 map uh, and the different CBF, CBV and leakage maps. And here you can appreciate also the co-registration of the CBV with um, uh, the anatomy and all this uh, nicely coded in a color scale. So I will go some representative cases through. So this is the case of an IDH muted GBM. We had a M MGMT methylation, which is a known factor for, for these tumors being prone to pseudo progression. And uh, you see, first of all, the appreciate the enhancing tumor part, which uh, was suspicious for uh, tumor recurrence. Uh, you see here the CBV map without leakage correction, and you hear a very slender rim of hyperperfusion. However, if we apply leakage correction, this signal has been suppressed. So actually, it's a nice example how the leakage correction can increase the specificity and can avoid um, any false positive results. Another case of now an IDH mutant GBM. Oh, I'm sorry, it's the same case of the IDH mutant GBM. Now, we, I show you the follow-up. So a couple of months later, you see how this enhancing region which using perfusion was uh, classified as pseudoprogression uh, is now in the phase of the resolution. This is another case of an IDH wild type GBM, again methylated. You see the follow-up of this uh, tumor between December 2017 and July 2018. We have a fairly stable amount of white matter edema. You see here also the uh, tumor cavity and in, uh, in the contrast enhancement you see uh, the necrotic area and the very patchy enhancement around the area. This enhancement proves to be negative in the perfusion map. This was another case again of pseudo progression or treatment related changes. Now you see how this tumor involves. So at that time 
in the December in the 2017 was a very a very thin rim. Then in March 2018 is when we performed the perfusion and we uh, saw that it is treatment related changes and a couple of months later the contrast enhancement starts to disappear. And these were two uh, pseudo progression cases. Now here is a true recurrence case. Again, extensive white matter edema, uh, very inhomogeneous and irregular enhancement. And here the perfusion map shows clearly the hyperperfusion, which corresponds to this area. And this was a true progression, was confirmed further um, by surgical biopsy. Now, the cumulative results show that if we have uh, leakage-corrected RCBV in treatment-related changes, uh, the ratio compared to the white matter is around 2.3, and when the recurrent disease has 4.1, almost the double, and the, correct, the statistical significance was very high, uh, resulting in an accuracy of 92%. Uh, you, can, you may use also the mean, which has been widely utilized in literature, however, you see that there is no significant results. So, we would suggest to go for the maximum RCBV within the tumor segmentation to differentiate between the two entities or to use the 19th percentile. Now, I mentioned before about a novel approach. So we started thinking how to implement AI techniques in helping us increase further diagnostic confidence. For this reason, and due to the quite uh, limited patient population, we went for a support vector machine um, version. And in that case, we tried to put into the algorithm both the structural as the perfusion. So the structural, Data means how the radiologists perceive uh, the follow-up, what they do, what they mentally actually post-process in order to establish the diagnosis. And the perfusion is, offers the add-on. So this add-on, now let's see how it changes the way or the confidence or the diagnostic accuracy. So here are some uh, actually details of how we perform the SVM analysis. We did multiple iterations and we used the leave one out cross validation in order to achieve uh, features elimination. And what is more important are these graphs here. We see that if we have a single time point analysis, we might have a very good sensitivity, but the specificity is at, the, uh, at around 90%. Now, if we combine support vector machine with multiple time points, we increase, we lose a little bit in sensitivity, but, but most importantly, we increase specificity. Now, both approaches, where I'm actually obviously SVM with multiple time points is the best, both approaches outperform the radiologist. So you see the very low uh, sensitivity and specificity rates that the radiologist has, even actually if he has multiple time points available. So also how performs actually the structural compared to the uh, structural and perfusion? These are the three columns. The perfusion is only the blue. Of course we have a huge diagnostic error if we rely only on perfusion. The structural has less error but if you combine the structural and perfusion in the orange uh, box whisker plot you see that you eliminate the error below 0.05. So to summarize, we see that DSC MRI with proper leakage correction and wall white matter CBV normalization is very robust, is very reliable and gives us high accuracy using the maximum RCBV and the 19th percentile uh, values. I stress again the need to do multiple time point DSC MRI because actually enhances significantly the diagnostic accuracy and if you combine that with a DSC MRI radiomics as well as structural radiomics and put them under the umbrella of an A algorithm, um, in that case support vector machine or something more elaborate, then the results are outstanding. Actually it seems that it might outperform the radiologist and this is definitely the future of the method.
Thank you very much.